Uh, Big Lundy, welcome to the show. Can you guys hear me? Perfectly well, yes. Fantastic. Um, I wanted to discuss Sam Harris and objective morality here for a little bit. You guys ta- touched on objective morality earlier. Oh, we and, always we always touch on objective morality. It's one of our favorite things here. Uh, it's, I, I, I don't know whether from, you were here at the beginning of the show. I do actually have, it's now under a stack of Bibles and copies of uh, the Quran, uh, but I do have his book. Um, but as you will see, I've not really gone very far into it. So do go on. I've got it as well, and I've bookmarked some several places that I think are very uh, profound in my opinion. Well, I've got about 10 in, and I've only got to page 24. So. <laughs> uh, I, I personally feel that Sam Harris has a very substantial position when it comes to uh, objective morality. I, I, it may what be I, substantial. Is it substantially good or substantially in error? I think that he has valid points to make when he formulates objective morality. Um, a lot of a lot of people like to criticize the position that what he's doing is he's taking the subjective value of human well-being and um, placing an objective moral framework on that. And people say that, you can't that do that. That has been my criticism, and I have been criticized for that criticism. So do carry on. I'm be interested to hear. At the moment, so far as I've got, he's not really put um, a coherent definition of objective morality, so I'm, I can't really comment on it, but do go on. Or, or I think the other aspect could be that it could be tautological, so you could have bad feelings are bad, right? Well, of course bad feelings are bad. I mean, that's their definition. So if suffering is, is, is connotated as uh, a bad sensation, and you want to say that bad sensations are bad, then duh, right? That's my only response to that. I, well, I think I, I, I want Big to answer because he's obviously read more of the books sorry. than I have, but he si- does seem to be um, addressing on the basis of uh, human suffering and well-being. Big, do carry uh, on. Human suffering is is de- generally characterized by Harris as bad, but he doesn't just say tautologically suffering is bad because suffering is bad because suffering is bad. Uh, he goes into big detail and as well as uh, gives many sources for quantitative research in the, in the area of why it is we don't like suffering, why it is that we don't want to experience um, negative brain states, why, why we consider those brain states to be negative in the first place. He gives a lot of uh, citations as to why we do that. So I don't think that it's as simple as a tautology to say that suffering is bad, um, especially not as he expounds on it. Um, as, as far as his definition of objective goes, when he says objective morality, he fall, he's what's called a moral realist. I share his position as a moral realist. That is that not not that we can derive one answer that w- that is completely one hundred percent the correct answer to every single um, moral dilemma, um, but that we can come up with answers that are better than other answers. All you need to do in order to accept what he's saying is is accept that there are good answers to a dilemma, to a dilemma and bad answers to a dilemma. Can I agree. agree that? I agree. That seems to be the message that I'm picking up from the book. But my problem is that if he's then using that or using objective to describe that, then I have a problem with that use of the word. And it may be, as I say, that my misunderstanding of his position is all down to his definition of objective because. What you've just described to me doesn't fit in, in into any meaning of objective that I, as I understand it. Well, as he expands on objective, what he mean, what he says by objective isn't exactly a new definition. It's been around for several hundred years. Um, it's the same objective that we use in. It, it's the same manner of objective that we use in mathematics in in all scientific research. Um, what tends to be the disconnect that I've observed between other atheists rejecting what he's saying is that um, if you start from a subjective standpoint of a value, then you cannot derive an objective framework from that. And I don't think that that's true. I've um, given the uh, example of if I value human well-being, and that is subjective, then I ought not run over people with my car for fun. But that's objective. I can objectively test whether or not running people over with my car for fun is going to be conducive to their well-being. That's an objective fact. Would that not be accurate? Yeah, I, I completely agree with that, that statement. No concordance wants to comment. Concordance. No, no, yeah. So I, I completely agree with that statement that you can objectively evaluate a subjective criteria. But there is no way. I mean, if you've got any background in philosophy that I can think of, I cannot think of a way in which a value system 
can be based on the independent of a mind, something inherent in the object with no need for a subject to perceive that you could have a value system of any kind without a subject. Well, I do actually have a background in philosophy. Currently, I'm a student. I'm going to be approaching post-grad work here soon enough, and I'm aiming for a PhD in the subject. Um, So what I would say to that is that there are plenty of scientific things that we would consider to be objective that are based, that are mind-dependent. Um, if you were to say that we cannot base objectivity on something that's mind dependent, can you give us an example of what you're referring to? So we've got a sort of handle. On cognitive science. You're uh, saying that there's, there are some things that are objective. Well, the discoveries we make in cognitive science are mind dependent, correct? We need a mind in order to make these discoveries. That's trivial. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, the, it may the sound things, trivial, but the it's things a contain the properties. The things contain the properties. We are not evaluating the things. We we as subjects have no part in that, right? So a pair of neurons, right, from a brain uh, may have a certain property, but that's in the neurons. That's not in us looking at the neurons. Does that make sense? It's not in the subject. It's in the object. Right, and this, this, this alludes to a higher problem that seems to be occurring, and that's the messy objective-subjective distinction. Uh, Sisyphus Redeemed is a philosophy professor, and he's expounded on this in a video where he criticized Bionic Dance for her criti- for critiques of Sam Harris. Um, that it, it, really, it really is a very messy uh, distinction to say that one thing is objective and one thing is subjective when you start from the position of if minds are dependent on, the, on whatever it is, then it's necessarily subjective. Because well, Vic, let, let, let's see if we can clarify. Um, what is your definition of objective and subjective? Uh, objective would be something that is true regardless of our input. And See, I, I be, tend to agree with you on that. Um, uh, but, but the thing is, we can come up with, the, with that level of objectivity given subjective values. And as I've already explained, that one of the examples of which would be, if I value human well-being, I ought not run over people with my car for fun. That, that's an objective moral fact. But you smuggled in the subjective... As a precondition, I, I, I understand. You're objectively your... evaluating a subjective morality, and I'm I, fine I, with that. Can and I just I say welcome back Sam to the show, Michael? Doing. And I think we probably are picking up very much where he left off, Michael. We have <laughs> yeah, been discussing. I was about to say. We have been discussing other issues in the meantime, but welcome back to the show. I'm sorry, I interrupted, but uh, isn't concordance right there? Because um, you you have, as he says, smuggled in um, the subjective value. I don't think it's smuggled in. I think it's very plain that we are putting in that subjective value. I just don't think that that in any way delineates the objectivity that we can derive from any sort of moral statement. You've come up with a criteria to evaluate whether or not you're achieving your morality. right? You've come up with an objective measurement, and that's fantastic. But if you say that, uh, let's say, a rock is pretty if it is symmetrical or if it is shiny. All right, shiny and symmetrical are, are objective properties because they're in the rock. But pretty is something that we decide that is how we evaluate the prettiness of a rock. Do you see how you've got a complexity here? Anytime there's a judgment call being made, to me, that implies a subject, a mind, evaluating criteria, which makes it a subjective system. See, now, I just I just disagree with the whole notion that as you've put it, smuggling in the subjective notion of a value of human well-being is in any, is in any way detrimental to the objectivity that we can give from any sort of moral statement. You, you drew a parallel from uh, um, rocks being pretty if, they're, if they hold certain properties, but we still think that but our evaluation of what is pretty is still subjective. But that, to me, doesn't matter. I see a huge difference between saying rape is wrong because of X and Y and saying that uh, a rock is pretty because of X and Y. Aesthetics and morality are two completely different subjects to be uh, uh, comparing the two. Well, maybe that's our fundamental disagreement, and maybe it's because I'm I'm a scientist and I have different perspectives and I want a panel with two philosophy-type people, but... Um, I, I feel like I have it 
pretty. I mean, you know, you and I could disagree on what makes a pretty rock because that's a subjective property, right? We could, we we could, I think, debate whether or not something was symmetrical, but it's something it can be measured objectively because it's a property of the object. I I, I don't want to keep going in circles on this. I, I think we've. We've each made a point. Let's try something else. Okay. Well, Sam likes to draw his justification for placing a value on human well-being on the uh, uh, average of people in general across cultures, placing a value on human well-being. Now, that level of value that we place on these things can differ across cultures, but the fact is the value is still there. We all across cultures desire certain states of being. We, we have certain needs that need to be required in order for us to continue living, and we all uh, desire to continue living, and we would consider those who don't desire to continue living to have some sort of uh, mental problem. Um, so to disregard the fact that, to disregard the entire idea of objectivity stemming from uh, a subjective value simply because um, that value is subjective, to me, that just... I, I don't know. That just doesn't. I don't see how you make that connection. How you draw that particular conclusion. One of the things I'm hoping to find out in uh, Sam's book is how he makes this uh, measurement of what is human well-being. Um, can you throw any light on that? Give me a bit of a spoiler. Uh, uh, the measurement of human well-being. Well, firstly, before I do that, and I know this is kind of lame, but I. I mm, I'd like to clarify that I'm part of this other blog TV group called Trolling with Logic, and my, my, the guy who leads it wants to know if it's okay if he uploads uh, his recording of my call to his channel, if that's okay with you. Of course. All, all, every part of this program is published on YouTube for anyone to use as they wish. Fantastic. All right. Uh, now, you asked how Sam Harris goes into the uh, establishment of human well-being, um, and in general what he does is he establishes... Uh, through scientific data, that which uh, uh, humans require to have a positive brain state, what is what the criteria is to have that sort of positive brain state, and um, uh, I'd, I'd have to read the words myself, and I can't. Well, I, it's I, okay. I, I mean, uh, help, help me with this. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll put it this way: I've I've always suspected, and I, I as I say, I, I may be proved wrong, and you might be able to help me with this. I've always suspected that in making that analysis, he is using subjective values. And if he's using subjective values, then are we not in the same position again where that cannot ultimately lead to an objective value? Well, here's, here's what he's written when it comes to psychology of happiness uh, under his, in his chapter, The Future of Happiness. Uh, I, I highlight this because I think this is very clear as to what he feels when it comes to uh, people subjectively valuing things differently. Um, to, to quote him, what does it mean, for instance, to compare self-reported ratings of happiness or life satisfaction between individuals or across cultures? I'm not at all sure. Clearly, a person's conception of what is possible in human life will affect her judgment of whether she has made the best use of her opportunities, met her goals, developed deep friendships, etc. Some people will go to bed tonight proud to have merely reduced their daily consumption of methamphetamine. Others will be frustrated that the rank in the Forbes 400 list has slipped into the triple digits. Where one is satisfied in life often has a lot to do with where one has been. So, to me... What he's clearly saying here is that we can, regardless of our differences, we, we recognize uh, a, a sort of objective framework in which we, we recognize um, success and uh, how I, the, word, the opposite word to success is failure. Uh, so if we can objectively clarify what that means, if we can objectively clarify what it means to be satisfied with your life, then... You know, but I, that's, I, that, that is the, at the heart of my problem with him. And what you've just read, I'm grateful for um, trying to clarify it, but it, for me it didn't clarify anything. It still seems to be somewhat subjective. And as someone posted in the comments on Blog TV, what does it mean to have a positive brain state? Uh, and maybe he goes into more detail. I want to bring Michael in because he's been sat patiently and I'm sure desperate uh, to give us his views. Uh, do you understand, uh, Michael, um, Harris's, the way Harris assesses uh, um, happiness and uh, well-being. Yeah, um, I think, by the way, is my audio better than it was before? No, it's okay. still appalling, but don't it's worry. Still, it's still shit? Okay. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Um, 
So I think the, in the passage that was just read, um, he's kind of getting to the idea of the difference between instrumental goals and talent goals, or like the, the uh, actual goal goal of things. So I think what Harris is essentially saying is that even though individual people have different instrumental ways of getting to happiness or to reduce suffering, we all agree that su that um, reducing suffering or uh, making our lives better in some way is a worthy goal, um, regardless of how we go about doing that or what we consider an individual achievement along that path. Um, is that, that about that right? Isn't that's a subjective judgment, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I think uh, okay. it's absolutely clear. Um, and this is where a lot of people really get messed up with objective morality, is the difference between at what are called in the literature talent goals um, versus instrumental goals. Um, everyone has different ways of achieving happiness. Like, that's just obviously true. Things that make me happy aren't going to make concordance or, or you happy, do you um, we're all different in that way. But that doesn't subtract from the general idea that suffering is bad, happiness is good, um, that truth is good, that uh, there are other qualities that we'd, we'd obviously assess that are, are good. So, and that really is... That really you see, when you say that, uh, truth is good. Truth is quite clearly not good in some circumstances. And the classic one that is always... Really? That's, that's the classic one that is always for... given is... Uh, the Nazis are knocking on the house where Anne Frank is in the attic. Is it, is it good to say, oh yeah, she's upstairs? Mm -hmm. So, oh, uh, that's, whenever anyone that's attempts to saying, make these sort of like bold generalizations, there always seems to be an exception to it. The, well, okay, well, I would like to clarify this because Harris has actually written uh, a book on lying and he's actually used that particular uh, example when it comes to him saying the lying is still that there are still better options than to lie to the Nazis and say that they're um, that they're that that Anne Frank is in fact not in your in your attic. Um, now he clarifies that it's still preferable to lie to the Nazis, but it's not it's not uh, by default the best option uh, simply because of the fact that you're lying. Um, what happens here is we have different values contradicting each other and which value takes precedence over uh, the value of truth and the value of human well-being. Human well-being in general takes precedence over all of our other values, including that of truth. Truth is still important. Truth is still very valuable. Uh, it's just that um, we, we delineate that value when human well-being is at stake. Okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, maybe maybe I'm confusing absolute with objective. I don't know, but it, I, that, it, it I, does seem it does. That's not that's not a very uncommon uh, objection that people tend to have uh, because Sam Harris redefines what objective means. He doesn't mean absolute. Uh, his whole book, Moral Landscape, is about the fact that there are multiple right answers to any uh, uh, moral problem. Well, that's one of the things I picked up and actually put a yellow tab next to is that he, he says quite clearly that he's not arguing that there is going to be a right answer to any particular um, moral dilemma, which is, I have to say, what I thought uh, he may be arguing. Um, but if he's not arguing that, then, as I say, he's, he's using a definition of objective, which is one that I'm not familiar with. I, I have to say, all of these arguments are, are fairly unpersuasive. I, I, for philosophers, I expected a more coherent and convincing argument. Do you both seem to have accepted this as self-evident? I, I, I don't get it. I don't, I don't feel it. Well, you're, you're likely to be tarred along with me, uh, concordance, as a philosophical illiterate. Uh, but Big, what do they do to, to you people in college? <laughs> <laughs> Big, uh, you wanted to come back, Big. I, I really want. I, I'd like to try and build some bridges here. What particularly is it that you don't find convincing about this formulation? Which you don't formulation? seem to have explained away the the fact that you keep smuggling in a goal. 
right? You, you, you're not using the very definition of subjective that I think you agreed to. But we're not whether saying- whether we were there or not. Uh, suffering is evil. Well, if we're not there, who is saying that suffering is is immoral or wrong or whatever word we want to use? Who who's saying it? We are. We are the establishments of the emergent property. <laughs> you see why I find that unpersuasive. <laughs> well, I can see why you would find that unpers- I can see why you'd find that unpersuasive, but I don't think that your reasoning for finding it unpersuasive are very persuasive themselves. Uh, again, the fact. But, but, the fact but not because with this, I'm I'm definitely with concordance. Uh, it, you 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 are sorry, can your I? own subjective views, Michael. I, I, sorry, I really, I really let, let, to, let yeah. Big respond. It's only fair, and then we'll come to you, Michael. Big then, Michael. I. <laughs> The whole idea that we're smuggling in a subject of value is completely irrelevant to me and to Sam Harris. He's fully aware that our value that we place on human well-being is subjective. He's not trying to explain that away and say that's not actually subjective. He's fully embracing the fact that that's subjective, but he's saying that that is a collective, uh, sub- inter- intersubjective um, value that we hold. Uh, and as that, it's are you spot. saying that? Are you saying, as I have described previously, that he is uh, using a summation of subjectivity to come up with something equating to objectivity? Because no. I've been criticised for that, and, and that seems to be exactly what you just said. No, what he's saying is that uh, our intersubjectivity f- towards our value of human well-being is, in essence. A sufficient justification to establish objective facts coming from that intersubjective uh, What's value. the difference between what you've just said and what I said? Because you're saying that I'm saying that, uh, that I'm saying that Sam Harris is saying this is completely convoluted. Um, but <laughs> uh, you're saying that Sam Harris is saying that intersubjectivity and agreed upon intersubjectivity equals objectivity, and that's actually not at all what he's saying. Okay. Fair enough. If that's not what he's saying. I say I'll have to read the book, but it sounded very much like it. 